we celebrate the second Sunday of Easter, also known as Low Sunday. We begin our liturgy on page 101 in the Book of Common Prayer. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Blessed Lord and Father, we have assembled in your name and in fellowship with one another. Enable us by your grace to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Together we pray, our theme call it, Almighty and generous God, you are the creator and giver of all that is good. We thank you and praise you for the beauty of the earth, for our work, our families, our loved ones, and all of the gifts. By your grace, may we show gratitude by sharing what we have received, always mindful that in serving others, we are serving you. Guided by the same grace, help us to be good stewards who care for your earth and who work to preserve it for future generations. We remain grateful for your constant love, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the presence of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We now be seated as we hear the word of God. The Old Testament read lesson. The reading is taken from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. The epistle, the second reading, the second reading from the book of First John, chapter one, verse one, to chapter two, verse two. First John. Chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father 
and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and what we have heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and to proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh. Uh -huh. 
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, the 20th chapter, beginning to read at the 19th verse. Glory be to Christ, our Savior. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my, ha and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ, our Lord. Our Lord.
some words taken from 1 John chapter 1 and 1. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. I speak to you now in the name of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. First John chapter 1. And we declare to you what was from the beginning. What we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, this life was revealed. Oftentimes when we hear of First John, the, the same chapter 1 normally comes to mind because we hear it so often. But 1 John 1, not verse 1, but anyone can tell me what verse we, we always hear? I hear it someone say. Oh, don't be shy this morning. Verse 9. 1 John 1, and we make this declaration if we say that we have no sin, we do what? We look how them words come from the Bible and we make them up. It is oftentimes said that we are not a, a Bible people, but scripture is written throughout our liturgy. And I, I just figured I'll share that with you this morning, because a lot of times we don't pay attention to that particular part of our act of penitence, the introduction. If we say that we have no sin, that it wasn't something that we came up with with priests, but that this comes directly from the biblical narrative, that we are reminded that we only make lies of ourselves, but even everything that Christ did and came to accomplish. But this morning, I want to point your attention to a theme that exists throughout all of our readings this morning. And I want to start with our first lesson, which comes from Acts of the Apostles, the fourth chapter. And it says this in verse 33, With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. We move on down to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. We hear, we declare to you what was from the beginning, and what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and what we have touched with our own hands. And then if we move over to the gospel for today, we have the encounter of the disciples in John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, where Jesus appears to his disciples. And here, one disciple is not in the midst of them by the name of Thomas, who after Jesus visits, they declare this to Thomas. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. In every one of our readings, they speak about a personal testimony, a personal proclamation of Jesus Christ in the lives of his disciples. And this ought to signal to us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is something that must become personal to every one of us. None of these disciples in any of these encounters from Acts to 1 John to the Gospel of John said that someone told us. But every one of them made the declaration that we have either seen him, that we have heard him, that we have touched him. But it was all from a personal perspective, personal encounter, a personal experience. And so you have heard the church over the 
decades and centuries called people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. An authentic experience that is based upon your own encounter and not what someone else has told you. And so because of this call, you've heard some people say from time to time that I found Jesus. Anyone here ever say that before? I found the Lord. I mean, Jesus never was lost to start with. It, 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 it would have been us who would have been somehow displaced and out of position and not paying attention and not checking for this fellow who's been here all along. Beating and knocking on the door of your heart. And so when we wake up and we come to a realization that this Jesus, he walks with us, he talks with us along life's way. We say, guess what I found? We, we excited, you know. Then we come to that moment of reconciliation because this is what the Easter message still sounds out to us. It calls all of us into a life of reconciliation, of not only turning away from sin, but entering into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But believe it or not, the world today, we are so focused on what's going on with, with everyone else. The past couple of weeks, I've had the privilege to be on a number of shows. And on every one of them, there were a number of people who wanted to call the church either hypocritical full of hypocrites, the, the church is not sincere, the church is duplicitous, the church is all kinds of things, and the people in the church. And every reason that is given is based upon what other people are doing or not doing or what they are not perceived as, as to why the church is either irrelevant or of no use to anyone any longer. But in the gospel and in Holy Scripture, there comes the challenge by way of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for you to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't blame me for that. You understand? You can't blame the priest forever. You can't blame the people who are sitting on the altar forever. I remember when I was first sent out and well, it wasn't my first assignment, but on one of my assignments in one of the churches where I was, someone came and they, they attended a, a funeral that I preached to, and, and the person said to me, boy, God, I enjoy this service, and I, I won't come back to church, but as, as soon as, but you need to get rid of one or two of them people, you got to be on the altar. <laughs> I say, who, which one, which, which two or three you need me to, yeah, but they shouldn't be up there because they this, that, and the net. So in order for me to get you one to come to church, I must get rid of my faithful two or three wicked lay people. <laughs> Who faithful, I mean, according to you, this is the best way to put it, who are faithful in their wickedness. Because <laughs> you don't come. But they show up in their wickedness, in their sin, in their human frailty, they show up week after week in reverence, in humility, in service to Almighty God and acknowledgement of their need and their dependence on Him. But you want me to get rid of them so you could come. Make that make sense for me. But we, this is what we are battling in the church, and in the world. But the call is not for exclusion, 
The call is not even for individuality. The call is towards a personal commitment that happens as a corporate body. Though we are many, we are, we are many. And though we are many, each and every one of us are called into a personal, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't answer for your children. You brought them to baptism where we made a commitment on their behalf, but there comes a point in every child's life after baptism, post-infant baptism, where they must decide that they will either accept the faith which their parents took on for them and that they will follow Jesus for themselves. And that is why the baptismal rite has in it that the godparents and parents will ensure that this child is brought to the bishop to be confirmed by the bishop. To affirm the faith which has been taken at the count by parents and godparents so that they now at confirmation can make that personal declaration that I believe in Jesus Christ. And that's why I love the Apostles' Creed. Liturgically, we should always use in corporate communion the Nicene Creed. It is traditionally the one that is prescribed for corporate worship where more, where most of our people are. And on Sunday, you see a lot of people use the, the Nicene Creed. And I don't pick that most Sundays because it is shorter. But it comes as a challenge for us not simply to say, we believe. I want you to say, I believe. Because you need to make your choices. You understand? Too often we just stand up and we just say with the crowd saying, yes, a couple of weeks ago, we hear what happened to the crowd, eh? They shouted, Hosanna! And then another couple of days later, somebody convinced them to say, crucify them. They got to be careful of the crowd, eh? What do you believe? And so the readings all call us into a personal relationship. My brothers and sisters in Christ, on this low Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, as we have come to continue our celebrations of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 1 John reminds us of the foundational truth upon which our faith stands. The apostles emphasize the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the testimony of eyewitnesses. They point to the reality that Jesus was not some made-up story, as some would claim, that Jesus was not real, that he was just this figure, but rather the foundation of our faith hinges on the fact that Jesus is in truth a historical person. And the disciples bore witness to this. We have seen him. We have heard him. And we touched him. Just last week, and I said to you, this is why Father always got a story. That's why I always got a story. Because like these men and women of old, I got something. Because as they believe in him as Lord and Savior, guess what? He is mine. And I need to tell someone of who Jesus is, not to Peter, not to Paul, not to my mother and, and everybody else. They, they help to bring me to an understanding. But there comes a point in your life and your journey where Jesus got to become something to you. Where you have a personal testimony that you can say that I have seen the Lord. I don't know about you, but anybody in here has seen the Lord at work in their life? Where you could, you could stand and you could testify and you could express with your mouth what is in your heart. And every one of them when, when Thomas wasn't there, and 
Thomas come, Thomas tell him, hey, listen, man. Even Thomas wanted to push in the spirit. And we just look down on him. Eh? But Thomas say, I hear you all in. You all see him. But I was in him. I was in him. And believe it or not, we need more Thomases in this world. We need more people who want a personal experience. Some of us, we, we so our ears and, and minds so ready to grab the first thing people tell us. And you know what we do? We run with it. And we don't never stop to, to verify, to see if, especially in this age of technology. The minute something someone sends to us, you know what we do? We call it. We ain't know if it's true, we ain't know if it's lie. We don't know if we if we tear down someone, if we bring in hurt or pain to someone else's life, all we need to do is, boy, this sound good, eh? Share. And the juicier the story, the more shares it is getting. But Thomas tell him, I ain't see it. But unless I put my hand, Thomas, I want to see it too. But Jesus did come behind and say, blessed is he who believes and has not what? But it is when we are prepared to share our personal testimony that those who have not seen and those who have not heard will come to believe. That Jesus is not some figment of our imagination, but rather he is, was, and shall be forever, not only the Son of God, but the Savior and Redeemer of mankind. And so 1 John seeks to establish through the personal testimony of these disciples, that in a world that is filled with competing worldviews and beliefs, that it is crucial for us to share, like them, this historical reality of Jesus, who not only lived then, but is still alive now. That we have seen him, that we have heard him, that we have touched him in our own lives so that others may come to know and believe in this reality. Secondly, this reading points to the authenticity and the assurance of Jesus Christ. In a culture plagued by skepticism and doubt, we are called to have confidence in our faith, knowing that it is based on credible witness accounts and historical evidence. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a mere myth or legend, but a historical reality attested to by those who walk with him. And so as we celebrate our own faith today, it must be grounded in the truth and authenticity that helps us to proclaim this word. And so this is where the faith of the apostles and their testimony comes. We stand on what they have provided for us. That's where you come and you root yourself in the Bible. But many of us, we can't stand boldly because we don't take the time to, to learn what Jesus did and what the disciples shared about his life so that we can recognize these things when they happen in us. When was the last time you sat down and, and, and took your Bible and read something? I don't want you to answer. Do you give enough time to the study of God's word where you read and to learn? Like one mother used to say, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. We will make our children sit down and study for hours. We will pay for private tutoring and private classes and after school classes, all so that they can learn and that they can have the knowledge and the skill and the confidence. But we don't insist that they come to Sunday school. We don't insist that they come to church. We don't insist that they come to confirmation class. We don't insist that they come to church. And we don't insist that there be Bible reading in our homes anymore. As a, as a child growing up, I used to read to my grandmother every 
and a part of that reading had to be the Bible. Have you ever taken out the Bible in your home and allowed your children to read it to you? And not so much as for your hearing, you know, for their own well being. So that they can know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives, and when they speak on it, they can speak with confidence and with boldness. That's why that's one of the major differences between us and some of the other people who come knocking. You know that's what it is be? Knowledge. They know what they believe. And they know the Bible they carry. And so they become an annoyance because they challenge us and many times we fall short of reality. But when you know my grandmother who passed Live right here in Nassau. She used to invite them in. My, my, my grandma used to open the door. And she used to say, come baby, come, come, come. Sit right here. And, and when they pull a, a Bible out, she used to say, hold on a second, hold on, hold on. Come on one second. I'm coming right back, eh? And she'd get up, she'd sit in one little white plastic chair, just as you walk through her front door. And she used to go down in her room and get her Bible. And she said, now come, let's, let's look at this thing, eh? What you, what you want to look at now? And she said, no, 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 not from that one over there. Come, come, let's deal with this one here. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's go to the real one, eh? Yeah. Ever fearful? But that comes over time when you immerse yourself in the word of God and it becomes implanted and rooted in your heart and you are able to speak with confidence irrespective of what anyone else thinks or believes because it is personal. When Jesus is personal to you, no matter what someone else thinks or believes, you shall not be swayed. No matter how many people turn up to church or how wicked the person is you believe is next to you, it will not deter you from coming to the house of the Lord. Because it's not about the next person, it is all about Jesus. But when you make the faith about the worthiness of these men sitting, you'll never come to church, baby. <laughs> if you can make it about the worthiness of us, we ain't never come to church. And if you don't believe me, anyone ever come to church with someone from the house and was upset before they leave home? No? That only happened to me. <laughs> On your way to church, and you mind, the car got silence. The person who's driving, they ain't only looking our way because they got to look straight. The one who in the passenger seat looking out the other window over there. And, and sometimes it's be not just your husband or your wife or your significant, sometimes be your children get your bets. And you feel like stopping and letting them out on the side of the road and <laughs> tell them <laughs> however you get there. But I just don't need you in my presence. But you just feel that way. And you come to church and, and then you realize, well, if I go the opposite way, people in church will know something happened. <laughs> Can't go this way, and the next one go that way. So you 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 go sit in the pew anyhow, and you leave that little awkward space right there. And you don't sit as close as you normally sit. You know, don't look at nobody in here this morning. Don't try to figure out who got more space between them today than they normally have. But those things happen. But we come because of something greater. We come because of something that is rooted in us, that is connected in a deep and a personal way. And that is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, beyond just authenticity and assurance and beyond 
Christ as the center of our faith, the readings point us that in this personal relationship, this personal challenge that comes to us to take Christ for ourselves, it draws us into fellowship and into community. Because we all, though we are many, we are because we all share in one faith. That personal faith that you have, that you claim that is yours, is shared by every one of these people in here this morning. And by our faith, we are drawn into fellowship and into community. Yes, in a society characterized by individualism and isolation, we are reminded of the value of community in nurturing and strengthening our faith. As we gather in worship and in fellowship, we are called to rejoice in the bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood that unite us as members of the body of Christ. That's why we come here. We come in fellowship and community to encourage each other in our common belief and faith. All of you here believe hopefully the same thing you and I do. Right? And on that road and this journey of life, it is kept a little rough at times. We become discouraged. We decide to lose faith. We sometimes lose hope. And when you show up to church, sometimes you are encouraged by others and they don't even know. That's the beauty of community. That's the beauty of fellowship. And then sometimes it happens knowingly. Someone walks up to you and hugs you and says, hey, listen, I know you're going through a lot right now, but don't give up, eh? I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your children. I'm praying for healing. I'm praying for restoration. I'm praying for renewal. I know things are a little tough. Take this little thing and just... Yeah, you hear what, what Ark said this morning? That the early believers did? And, and I know when we hear this read, sometimes it's like, boy, father, I saw... I don't know what they were doing back then. Those who had much possession, they sold everything, and they came together, and they, Father, you want me to sell all my things? And bring, the, bring all to the church? That's the challenge there. But you know why they did it? They did it to help those who could not help themselves. And so we are here just to worship, you know, and to fellowship. We are here to lift each other up and in community. Just this last week, and to show you how we've strayed from the biblical teaching, a very simple example. A father is killed as the primary provider for his family who has committed his life to public service. And in the hour of need, an appeal is made on behalf of his family. And the sad reality, not so much from people outside of the community of faith, but many people who call themselves Christians, only thing they can have to say is negativity. Let them make their own way. Take the children out of school. How insensitive, how unchristian, how unchristlike when we have, we have become, when helping other human beings uh, is frowned upon and seen as something that is not a necessity and not something that a community of faith should be engaged in. But we find with knocking on Father, you got any, any food store voucher? You, you know, you're not making soup this week. Then you eat the people's soup and then talk about it by it anyhow. And that's what we just do. But fellowship comes with responsibility. By virtue of our belief in Jesus Christ, 
we are called and drawn into fellowship and worship and that fellowship demands of us because look how much Jesus cared for us. And we can't give a little something to each other. Right here in this church, we are called to care for one another in our times of good, in our times of bad. That's what the church is all about. And if we are not here to respond to every form and manner of human need that exists around us, we might as well close the doors and go home. And if we are going to be a part of negativity, but we want to come to this communion rail week by week, we need to check ourselves. Eh? When we are called into a life of compassion. And so this morning, all of our readings call us to examine where we are in our brokenness and where we need Jesus to come in. And to call us into a life of evangelism. Anyone else in the readings here? Thomas Minnis here. They always make an appeal for people to join the ministry. And some of us will say, well, Father, I don't want to be a part of no formal thing. Hey, you don't got to put no label on yourself, but if you know Jesus, I'm going to see you. Put your hand up this morning. Okay, you all don't know him yet? You better hurry up. And when you get to know him, you got to share. You got to tell somebody about him. That ain't just my job. That's for all of us to do it. That ain't just for the evangelism team. They go out formally and they go from house to house and to share, to find out what people need and to see how we can respond as a church. But I want you in your personal walk with Jesus to take it upon yourself to share the goodness of God with someone. To tell someone how good God is for you, why you love the Lord Jesus. Tell them I have seen the Lord at work in my life. Because every one of these stories this morning that we have read, every one of these accounts, they have given us a personal testimony. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have looked at and touched with our hands. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen. your encounter with the resurrected Lord. For he ought to be Lord and Savior of all of our lives. And so I do prepare now to stand and make your confession of faith. Remember these next words that you will say. I believe in God the Father. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is my hope and prayer that you will share that faith with someone. May this be your blessing in mind, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to now stand as we make our profession of faith, as we share with each other and with all we will encounter what it is we believe and who we believe in. Together, I believe in God, the Father. was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. Form B on page 107 in the Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, 
and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Guide them in justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our words may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the party eternal rest. That light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our needs and those of others. Almighty God, whom our needs, needs are known before we ask, help us to ask for the good accords to your will and the good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us, therefore, confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and one another in thought, word, and deed, and in what you have left undone. We are sorry and repent of all our sins for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is ours, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ, and by the one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and have all been made to drink of the one Spirit. May the peace of the Lord be always with you.
as first fruits of your new creation. For on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had blessed and given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had blessed and given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance. Therefore, Father, according to the command of your dearly beloved Son, and we offer you, Father, our sacrifice of thanks and praise. Send your Holy Spirit in these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer. And as we partake of this holy food of you and an end of life, may your Holy Spirit establish us as a royal priesthood with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, St. John the Baptist, and all your sons and daughters who share in your eternal inheritance through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with him and in him and through him. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, all night, with all who stand before you in earth and in heaven, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. As Christ our Savior taught us, may we pray together. Our Father in heaven, Break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The gift of God to the people of God. Our souls will feast and be satisfied, and we will sing glad songs of praise to Him, Lamb of God. As you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace.
with you. And also with you. In some of our prayers and praises as we give God thanks for coming to us. And this is no solely sacrament of the altar. As we say to the Abbey, eternal God and heavenly Father. God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. In the name of Christ. Good morning, Holy Trinity. It is indeed a pleasure to see you all in Mass today. We do hope and pray that we've all been blessed in word and sacrament and strengthened to be faithful to God as we begin this new week. Today we take the opportunity to welcome all of our visitors, those who are at Mass this morning, and we say a very special welcome to Mrs. Aries Mortimer Neely, who is visiting us along with Seal Bullen, and she is a member of St. Christopher's, and she celebrates her 95th birthday on the 13th. We say happy birthday in advance. Really, we pray God's blessings upon you, and we thank you for coming to be with us here at Holy Trinity this morning in anticipation of your 95th birthday. Stop. We also say welcome to Rochetta Ferguson visiting with Raymond Knowles, who's with us this morning. And we welcome all others who are at Mass today to be with us. We say welcome to each and every one of you. Today we want to take the opportunity to say thank you to our altar guild and our decorating team who did a marvelous job over the <laughs> Holy Week and Easter. celebrations they did they were here working hard all through and so we just want to say thank you to all of our ladies from our all together the decorating team that always comes through for our church uh, this was absolutely beautiful and we had a wonderful time on Easter Sunday and the church is still adorned this morning they worked hard and I am so proud of the work that they continue to do here in our church all of our special celebrations and our weekly services. So thank you, ladies, so, so very much. I would like to draw your attention to all other notices from page 7, 8, 9, and 10 in your bulletins. Please take time to read them uh, at your leisure. That's why we print the bulletin for you. Carry home, read, stay abreast. We prepare ourselves for the ACW's tea party this afternoon at 3 p.m., in the activity center. So please, those who are a part of that, you are called to be there on time. We want to take this moment to celebrate those who are celebrating birthdays with us. Those who have birthdays today or this week, could you please come? And as they make their way, it's good to see that we have our chicken with us this morning. I guess we get a little break from Andre. Glad to, glad to have you home, Arch on a little much needed break. Danielle's got her birthday this week. Got yes. Our prayers will come to where she is. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray, Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we give you heartfelt thanks for the gift of day, another year. Father, we thank you for the life of each of your children as they come to you today. We 
the celebration and the thanksgiving of the years that are now passed, and Lord, and for you allowing them to see this moment in time. Father, we pray for the outpouring of your grace and your favor upon their lives this morning. Father, prosper their every step. Father, order their steps in the way that you would have them go. And Lord, may they seek to not only worship you, Lord, in their acts of worship, but Father, may they seek to honor you in their living day by day professing and proclaiming you as Lord of their lives, wherever they may be found. And, O oh Lord, we pray that they may seek to be your witnesses all of their days, spreading far and wide your love. Now, Father, we pray that as you've granted them life, health, and strength in the years that are now past and gone, Father, bless them as they go forward in their lives with hope and joy. May your blessing now be upon them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Strengthen, preserve, keep them now and forevermore. Those who are celebrating anniversaries, any anniversary celebrants amongst okay, okay, good stuff. Uh, it is good to have Aunt Flory back out. She was away and had surgery, and she's prepared on her way with recovery. Glad to see you back out, darling. Getting them eyes right, so make sure that pot stay right. Seasoning don't go off. So, so we praise God for his work that continues. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. I believe that's all the announcements for today. Please be reminded to take with you your bulletins and stay abreast as to the activities in the parish. Mass on Wednesday resumes this week. Um, you had your little break. All right? So you all start them engines back up. I'll see you Wednesday morning. 6.30, Mass.
spotted through the mercy of God. Rest in peace.